the beast emerged from its lair. Its muscular body, covered in thick fur, was pierced by a damp, biting wind that cut to the bone. It listened intently to every sound, catching every movement around. The trees groaned and creaked their bare branches in unison. The wind carried a bouquet of sharp, intoxicating scents. Melting snow, autumn decay, the woody scent, slowly awakening sprouts, swelling buds. The smells of birds and small animals hiding underground blended into a complex symphony of aromas. The Swedish scent of decay, somewhere nearby a boar had fallen. The sharp, warning miasmas of other predators. The beast paused for a moment, studying the ground beneath its paws. Rich and dense, gripped by the roots of plants, it breathed life and strength. The beast sniffed the air once, twice, drawing it in. Every morning and every evening the forest had its own life. The branches of the trees, covered in an icy crust, pierced the sky like the claws of a great beast. Birds in nests, hidden in thick foliage, waited for their moment to rise and begin a new day. Small animals, lurking in burrows and under the roots of trees, listened to every sound, fearing to become prey. The beast sensed their fear. Here, it was the master. But today, something had changed. An invisible force pulled it forward, forcing it to leave familiar places. It moved cautiously, trying not to leave tracks, but its huge paws still left deep imprints in the soft ground. The past did not bother it. It lived in the present, in every moment. With every breath, every movement, it felt the strength and power of nature. The beast stopped for a moment, raised its head and looked at the sky. The clouds were gathering, predicting a storm. The wind intensified, bringing scents. It caught a faint scent of smoke, very familiar, impossible to mistake for anything else in this world. The smell of a human body. The beast took a step forward, then another. It moved smoothly, almost silently, blending with the shadows of the trees. The scents became more distinct. Road grime, steel and metal gnawed by rust, mixed with the acrid, foul smoke that forms when burning. The smell of dogs and horses, the scents of fabrics and various objects, rope, glass, gunpowder. All this merged into a single stream of information accessible only to its heightened senses. All of this was unfamiliar to it, but it did not stop. Instinct drove it forward, overcoming fear and doubt. The beast stopped at the edge of the forest, looked ahead. In front of it stretched a wide plain, covered with mud. In the distance were the outlines of human presence. It knew that new challenges awaited it there, but it was not afraid. On the contrary, excitement awoke in it, the intoxicating scent of humans again. Hearing its echo, the beast remembered how long it had been in hibernation. Many days and nights, part of autumn, all winter. And all this time it had eaten nothing. The beast felt hunger. Its instinct sharpened. A predatory gleam appeared in its eyes. It knew that prey awaited it ahead. Its heart beat faster. Blood boiled in its veins. The beast quickened its pace, rapidly approaching the source of the scent. Every muscle, every movement was directed towards one goal, to find and destroy. The beast paused for a moment, listening to the surrounding sounds. It caught a faint noise coming from afar. These were footsteps, light and quick. A human. The beast sniffed the air, catching the Swedish scent of a human body. It was the smell of life, the smell of prey. Its nostrils flared, thoughts of the upcoming hunt raced through its head. It slowly crept closer, trying not to reveal its presence. Every step was calculated, every movement, smooth and silent. The beast was on edge, ready to pounce at any moment. It felt hunger, strong and overwhelming. This hunger was its driving force, pushing it forward. The scent grew stronger, 
bringing it closer to its goal. The beast stopped by an old tree. Ahead stood a man. He was alone and unaware of the danger. The beast's muscles tensed, its eyes lit up with a predatory fire. It knew it had to act quickly and mercilessly. This was its nature, its essence. The man didn't even have time to understand what had happened. In the next moment, the beast was already near, ready to deliver the fatal blow. The scraping of cutlery against plates drove Peter Walter crazy. It made his skin crawl and the hair on the back of his neck stand on end. Apparently, the others were not bothered by the scraping in the least. Peter set aside his knife and reached for his glass. After placing it back down, he looked around at those present. His brother was diligently carving the turkey. His wife, Anna, primly sipped her punch. Mrs. Gamp, the cook, moved around the table in a leisurely dance, clearing dirty plates and refilling the pitcher. The scent grew stronger, bringing it closer to its goal. The beast stopped by an old tree. Ahead stood a man. He was alone and unaware of the danger. The beast's muscles tensed, its eyes lit up with a predatory fire. It knew it had to act quickly and mercilessly. This was its nature, its essence. The man didn't even have time to understand what had happened. In the next moment, the beast was already near, ready to deliver the fatal blow. The scraping of cutlery against plates drove Peter Walter crazy. It made his skin crawl and the hair on the back of his neck stand on end. Apparently, the others were not bothered by the scraping in the least. Peter set aside his knife and reached for his glass. After placing it back down, he looked around at those present. His brother was diligently carving the turkey. His wife, Anna, primly sipped her punch. Mrs. Gamp, the cook, moved around the table in a leisurely dance, clearing dirty plates and refilling the pitcher. Walter Jr. placed another piece in his mouth, chewed it without tasting it, and forced it down his throat. Ernest finished his meal with a final flourish, a slice of salmon. He leaned back contentedly in his chair, and only then seemed to notice that he was not alone. Peter, he proclaimed, it's been a long time since I've had our signature family dish. It's still unrivaled. You wouldn't believe how much I've missed the ancestral home. Glad to hear it, Ernie, his younger brother dabbed his lips with a napkin. And we have Mrs. Gamp to thank for the food. She knows how to cook divinely. His brother gave a casual nod, sparing the woman a fleeting glance. Would you like some tea, gentlemen? Please. They settled by the coffee table. The day was gray beyond the arched windows. Massive curtains muted the breath of light, casting the living room in semi-darkness. Walter Hill dozed in provincial quiet. Just think, Ernest began, having emptied his cup. It's been three months since father's passing. I still can't believe it. The brothers involuntarily glanced at the large portrait of Thomas M. Walter, hanging neatly between two windows. Their father frowned down at them from the canvas, as if asking a question. His strong features revealed a man of courage and integrity. His eyes radiated stern kindness. Peter felt a lump rise in his throat. Sometimes I feel like he's still here, he managed. Sleeping in his room and will come down soon. Ernest sighed. I think that feeling will haunt us for a long time. But life goes on. We're no longer boys, Peter. We need to decide what to do next, as father managed a large business until his last days. Besides, he left behind land, property, and bank investments. Walter Jr. immediately understood where his brother was heading. He told me he had made a will long ago. He mentioned it before he... Really? Even better? I suppose we have the right to open it, in the presence of a lawyer. You're right, but there's a problem. Father didn't tell me where it's kept, 
It's definitely not with the lawyer. You can check. I'm not lying. Ernest's expression changed. He blinked frequently, his upper lip twitching. As if awakening from a trance, Anna looked at Peter in surprise. I believe you, Ernest mumbled. But it's strange. I suspect Father hid the document deliberately to avoid the temptation of contesting it, and he didn't get a chance to tell me where. I've searched the entire house several times, but found nothing. A futile endeavor, Ernest frowned. He could have hidden it in the barn or the stable just as well. Yes, our old man was always cautious. Only he couldn't foresee how things would turn out. The trio fell into a heavy silence. Here's what, the older brother said coldly. We can't stay here long. The children need care, right, dear? Anna finally spoke up. I need to get back. The little ones are waiting. And I have some matters to attend to, Ernest joined in. Let's do this. Try to find the will again, and if you can't, we'll have to inherit the property by law. I'll be waiting for your letter. Inform me of the results regardless. All right. And they left for Essex, not even staying the night. In the evening, by candlelight, Peter sat over an open book for a long time until fatigue overcame him. Again, night. Owls hooted anxiously. It was time to surface. The beast twitched its ear, listening. The wind brought good news, and it hurried to the source of the scent. Its emaciated but flexible and strong body glided silently over the ground. Hibernation had even simplified the task. It was light now, which made its movements more agile. The previous day it had explored the surroundings, memorized, and prepared. Today was the time to act. Having crossed the forest belt and a long, overgrown ravine, the beast approached the road. In the distance, the lights of human structures flickered. The packs of people sat there in safe dens, warmed by the fire and babbling in their language. For a moment, it clearly and distinctly saw how they looked in daylight, their females and young ones. But a strange haze quickly replaced this vision, overwhelmed by an ancient call. The beast crouched low and crawled to the edge of the road, where a man appeared in the distance. The man had just emerged from behind the bend, but the beast already knew everything about him, thanks to the thick scent that flowed ahead of him for hundreds of meters. A bouquet of human sweat, the unwashed body, strong tobacco, cheap cologne, and alcohol. The silhouette staggered, his legs tangled. The man slowly trudged along the rut, mumbling a song incoherently. His shoes squelched in the puddles, but the drunkard didn't notice. The beast pressed its ears back. At the sight of the approaching prey, its mouth filled with saliva. The man stumbled, almost fell, but regained his balance and cursed loudly. He spat and wiped his mouth with the sleeve of his coat. When his unfocused gaze locked onto a pair of gleaming eyes in the dark, the beast leaped. Peter had a headache since morning. He felt a throbbing pain, radiating to his temples, and every sound seemed louder than usual. To distract himself, he decided to go for a horseback ride after lunch. The weather was cool but sunny, and the air promised freshness and vitality. The snow had not yet completely melted, but here and there, tender young grass poked through the melting ice. Birds sang joyfully, creating a melody that at first irritated Peter but gradually became soothing. Peter set his horse at a trot, enjoying the rhythmic movement and feeling the cold air chill his nose and ears. He breathed deeply, allowing the freshness to penetrate his lungs, hoping it would help alleviate his headache. To his relief, the pain began to subside, dissipating under the influence of the coolness and motion. Lord Walter lazily surveyed the family lands, his gaze catching on various interesting details. He saw how the grass revived after the winter sleep, 
how the trees began to cover with the first leaves. Nature seemed to be waking from its long winter slumber. The landscape was calming, but his mind was still swarming with thoughts. What now? How to live on? These questions troubled him, driving stubborn thoughts away, but they kept returning like pesky insects, forcing him to revisit them repeatedly. After riding five or six miles from the estate, Peter turned onto a side road that led back home. This road was familiar to him since childhood. He remembered riding here with his father, inspecting the lands together, and discussing the future of the estate. Memories flooded over him, but he tried not to succumb to them, focusing on the road ahead. A carriage with a police emblem on its side rolled towards him. It was a rare visitor in these parts, and intrigued, Peter decided to follow it. The procession crossed a field and delved into the park forest, known for its dense thickets and old trees that held many secrets. As he approached, Peter could make out a small crowd on the road, among which he saw the helmets of bobbies and heard command shouts. The carriage stopped at the roadside and several policemen got out, immediately starting to give orders. Peter dismounted and walked towards the gathering. Many, mostly villagers, recognized and greeted him, making way. The young lord was respected in these parts, and his appearance always drew attention. Making his way through the crowd, Peter looked around, trying to understand what had happened. There was a tense atmosphere in the air, people whispered, casting anxious glances at the policeman. Finally, he found himself face to face with a stocky man, thickly bearded up to his eyes. What do you want, sir? Peter introduced himself and asked about the situation. There, the man said as if that explained everything, pointing to a body lying in the mud, covered with cloth. Even the cloth, already soaked in blood, could not hide the horrific injuries inflicted on the unfortunate person. Blood had pooled into a puddle, mixed with the muddy earth, melting snow, and turned into a brown sludge reflecting the March sky. What are you standing around for? The man suddenly barked at the crowd. There's nothing to see here. Move along. The policeman began to shoo away the onlookers with renewed vigor. I hope I can stay. Peter paled but tried to maintain his composure. If you want... The man grumbled, pacing around the body and inspecting the tracks. Just don't get too close. It's not a pleasant sight. He was the coroner. What happened here? A murder? I doubt it, sir. The expert paused, measuring Walter with an appraising look. More likely an accident. Want to take a look? Yes. The coroner, like a magician, whipped the cover off the corpse, and Peter saw how mutilated the body was. Oh my God, he breathed, bringing a handkerchief to his mouth. Who could have done this? I think a wild animal, the expert said. A wolf. Or a starving dog. Maybe even rabid. And of enormous size. It gave him quite a mauling. We found the leg about ten yards south, but the arm is still missing. We need to warn the populace. The cloth was returned to its place. You can pack it up now. The men from the carriage brought out a stretcher. Peter leaned against the carriage, trying to catch his breath. The coroner looked at him sympathetically, his mustache twitching. Suddenly, Peter straightened, staring glassily at the policeman, then somewhere into the forest. There. In a minute, they were standing near a fallen, rotting black tree, under which lay an arm, gnawed off at the forearm. The blue fingers were strangely curled, with the index finger beckoning. How did you know? The coroner asked in awe. I guessed. Walter seemed as shocked as the others. The man pulled his hands out of his coat pockets, took out a notebook, and scribbled something with a stub of a pencil. You know what's interesting about this whole story? Peter shook his head. 
The coroner leaned closer and, lowering his voice, confided. The body is badly damaged, but not gnawed. Only one organ is missing. Which one? The victim's heart is torn out. The taste of meat depends on many things. The most important is that the meat is fresh. Even better if it's alive. Quivering, beating with hope of escape, in fear. When the prey understands it's doomed and will soon die, it truly lives. This fear, this despair adds a special flavor to the meat, saturated with adrenaline, which the beast felt with every cell of its body. The beast loved such moments. Hunting was worth it for this, stalking for hours and lying in ambush, for everything to be decided in a matter of seconds. It was not just a hunt, but an art, a dance of death, in which the beast was an unparalleled master. It understood, with some animal instinct, that it was created for this, that this was the meaning of its existence, its purpose. In such moments, it felt at one with nature, with its cruel laws. Male meat differs from female meat. It is tougher and more fibrous. It is good to tear with fangs, but in terms of taste, it is significantly inferior. Another important factor is age. Old meat is dried out and resembles a sponge, worse only than carrion. But the flesh of a youngling literally melts on the tongue, its tenderness and juiciness indescribable. Young blood pulsing in the temples saturates each piece with energy and life, which the beast absorbed, growing stronger. Approaching a stream, the beast dipped its muzzle into the icy water and drank long and greedily. The cold water burned its throat, bringing relief and freshness. It felt how each drop awakened it, preparing it for the next stage of the hunt. This time it was not in a hurry. The primary hunger was satisfied. Now it could play. The beast knew the game would be long, that every moment would bring pleasure and enjoyment. It looked down from the hill at the human settlement. Some windows still glowed with light. Smoke streamed from the chimneys. This smoke smelled different, not like a forest fire, but something homely, cozy, yet at the same time provoking a desire to destroy this coziness, to bring chaos. Occasionally a dog barked, its voice carrying through the night silence, warning of danger. But the beast was not afraid. It knew that no dog could stop it. The beast carefully examined the village, studying every detail. It noticed the small things that might escape the attention of others. A light breeze carried the aromas of food cooking in the houses and the smells of people busy with their chores. It felt their fear, their anxiety, even if they themselves were not aware of it. This fear was its ally, it nourished it making the hunt even more thrilling. The beast slowly descended from the hill, trying not to attract attention. Its paws stepped softly on the ground, making no sound. It was a shadow, a ghost, moving through the night, leaving only traces of terror behind. Emerging at the edge of the village, it paused, listening to the sounds of the night. Somewhere in the distance, an owl hooted startling small rodents. It paused for a moment, lifting its head and sniffing the air. The wind brought scents, helping to choose the direction. It caught a faint scent of fresh blood, enticing and alluring. This was a sign that its potential prey was nearby. The beast did not hurry, savoring the process. Its path lay through a field overgrown with tall rye. The stalks swayed, creating a kind of maze in which one could easily get lost. The beast smoothly descended into the restless ocean of rye, dissolving into it, becoming a part of it. Ahead awaited new challenges, a new hunt. Peter spent Saturday evening at the gentlemen's club. The crowd was sparse. Walter Jr. wandered among the semi-familiar faces, occasionally engaging in conversation or taking a glass of brandy from a tray. The president had organized a formal dinner, 
so the male company was complimented by several ladies. The main topics of conversation were the upcoming wedding market, the theater season in London, and the latest news. Old maids cast covetous glances at him. Moth-eaten widowers tried to grab his sleeve. Walter tried to turn away as quickly as possible. Anyone who attempted to start a conversation inevitably mentioned his father, and it annoyed him, as if there were no other topics. Salvation came among the whist players. Walter had a few pounds on him, so he was ready to play some cards. He wandered around the tables until he stumbled upon an old friend, John McCarthy, who was losing desperately. Their opponents were a family acquaintance, Lord Campbell, and a marine officer named Jabin, whom Peter had not met before. At first, the game was erratic and somewhat slow. Jabin, barely glancing at his cards, prattled on about his exploits in the African colonies, about hunting lions, about the Zulus, and the fever epidemic. Campbell was exclusively interested in politics and import duties. John told Irish jokes, finding them witty. Walter sipped brandy and felt a deceptive lightness. The rounds dragged on, third, fifth, and gradually a pile of chips grew in front of Walter. The conversation faded, the men focused on the game. John and Walter were lucky for another two robbers, but then a streak of bad luck set in. Experienced Campbell played skillfully. The officer was smart enough to support him. Cards rhythmically slapped the table, cutting the suit and falling into hand. Walter felt a surge of excitement and before the next round said, I'm going all in. I accept the challenge. Campbell nodded, showing agreement. John dealt. Peter opened his cards and counted the trump cards. The layout was good, but somehow, John was off his game. Every move he made was disastrously wrong. Walter held on for a while, but the moment came when the outcome of the game became obvious. Campbell laid his cards on the felt and smiled triumphantly. Congratulations, said Peter. If you manage your affairs as you play whist, the officer said loudly, twirling a chip in his plump fingers, the Walter estate is in for a sad fate your father was more prudent. The game partners, and even some at neighboring tables, laughed good-naturedly. Something happened to Peter. He was overcome by a wild, primal rage. What do you mean? That one should think before entering a game. Otherwise, you might end up penniless. The officer laughed again. But a fool disregards the law. The smiles around them instantly faded. I demand an apology, Peter rasped in a voice not his own. He suddenly wanted to sink his teeth into that greasy, smug face and tear it to pieces. Why would I? Jabin inquired. I see no reason. With one swift motion, Peter swept the cards, chips, Campbell's yet unclaimed money and filled glasses off the table. Liquid splashed onto the offender's uniform. Someone let out a short squeal. You'll see now, he stood up. Jabin turned crimson like a ripe tomato and hissed, How dare you? Silence fell instantly. McCarthy quickly grabbed the reeling Walter under his arms and dragged him out of the room. Campbell followed, speaking reassuringly about something. The hubbub resumed, but Peter managed to catch the clear. Drunken fool. Peter wanted to break free, but he was tightly bound by two more gentlemen. Gently supporting him under his elbows, they led him to the exit. Everything swam and doubled before his eyes. His stomach contents threatened to come up. The beast enjoyed it when the prey couldn't see but sensed its presence. First, a vague, barely noticeable anxiety touched it, gradually growing into unease, making it look around for the enemy glance back, listen to every rustle, freeze in a tense posture. Finally, the fear reached such a level that even a mouse's squeak made it jump. But this had a limit, after which the weak prey surrendered, while the strong continued to fight for its life. 
The beast liked hunting the strong most. Lately, such had become rare. Today, it was a weak one, justified by the fact that it was a female. The beast did everything quickly. Too much noise could have alarmed the village and interfered with finishing the job. It had almost finished when another human emerged into the light. This one was a youngling. He called out to the female, Mary, where are you? Mary, answer me. The beast tensed its muscles and worked its jaws faster. The youngling ran around the well and froze. The beast lifted its bloodied muzzle, growling deeply. It was about to pounce on the youngling, but something stopped it. Stopped it as if by an internal command, authoritative and harsh. Peter's head ached from the moment he woke up. The pulsating pain spread to his temples and every sound seemed louder than usual. He decided to go for a horseback ride after lunch to clear his mind. The weather was cool but sunny, and the air promised freshness and vitality. The snow hadn't completely melted yet, but here and there, tender young grass peeked through the melting ice. Birds sang joyfully, creating a melody that at first irritated Peter but gradually became soothing. At any moment, the human child could have screamed. But he remained silent, staring at the beast with wide, bright eyes on his round little face. It would have been easy for the beast to tear his head off with one snap of his jaws. It seemed the child knew this. A small puddle had formed under his feet. Waiting any longer was becoming dangerous. The beast snapped his fangs and darted into the night. If something like this happened today, he thought as he ran, he should prepare. Time was running out. Peter stared forlornly at his soup. Steam rose in thick tendrils from the bowl. He had no appetite for it. His headaches had worsened, especially tormenting him in the mornings. Waiting for the soup to cool, the young lord unfolded the latest issue of the times. The lines blurred into a monotonous, inky mess, stubbornly refusing to form words. Should he send a servant to the pharmacy? Peter wondered absent-mindedly. With great effort, he read, In Germany, a new crown prince, Friedrich Wilhelm, now named Friedrich III, has ascended the throne. And also, the first photographic camera from Kodak capable of taking up to a hundred pictures has gone on sale. Peter sighed and closed his eyes. The light painfully cut through his eyelids. This had never happened to him before. And then that idiotic stunt at the club. Incomprehensible. How are you feeling, Sir Walter? Thank you, Mrs. Gamp. Tolerable. The cook had brought a basket of freshly baked bread. You don't look well. Her penetrating gaze was impossible to escape. Perhaps you should postpone your studies in that... What's it called? Surgery. Walter was studying to become a doctor. Yes, that. Unfortunately, dear Mrs. Gamp, I cannot. No one will study it for me. The elderly woman clattered the dishes, setting the table according to etiquette. The clinking of porcelain echoed dryly through the empty hall. She was about to leave, but Peter said, Please... Stay. Sit with me. As you wish, Mrs. Gamp agreed gently. Have you heard what's happening around here? No. What exactly? You don't know? The cook was genuinely surprised. They say a werewolf has appeared in the forests near our town. Peter snorted. Another tall tale. As if we're living in the Middle Ages. Tell that to the three dead men with their hearts ripped out. Mrs. Gamp retorted weightily, folding her arms across her chest. My friend Mrs. Rooney's nephew says he saw it himself, just as clearly as I see you now. The boy caught the hellish creature at the scene of the crime and nearly gave up the ghost. According to his description, it's a huge ash-gray wolf with yellow eyes and a mouth full of fangs the size of penknives. They say the werewolf only hunts at night, Daylight can kill it. It stalks late-night passers-by, 
sneaking up and tearing them to pieces. A wild, perhaps rabid dog. Walter shook his head uncertainly, recalling the coroner's bristly sideburns. Maybe. But after the evening bell, I won't even stick my nose out the door. That's that, Sir Peter. Mrs. Gamp looked at his plate. You haven't even touched your food. Peter ate a few spoonfuls out of politeness. And what's here? He glanced at the covered dish. Roast, sir. Walter lifted the cover and immediately changed his expression. For a moment, he stared at the dish in confusion. Then, with some kind of delight, he speared a piece of pork with his fork and swallowed it without even chewing. Rolling his eyes, he let out a groan of pleasure. He grabbed more meat and more, until only the garnish was left on the dish. Licking his lips, Peter asked, Mrs. Gamp, do you have any more meat left? Even a little? I'm ready to eat a whole boar. The two-legged ones were seriously worried. The next night, they lit bonfires around the village. Bright tongues of flame lit up the darkness, creating an illusion of safety. But to the beast, these were just pathetic attempts at protection. He sniffed at the tufts of grass, thinking disdainfully about how foolish they were. They only cared about themselves, as if there were no other creatures nearby capable of cunning and strength. The beast knew that these fires would not stop him, would not prevent him from doing what he was made for. Circling the first hunting ground in a wide arc, the beast caught the scent of new victims in the hayloft. There were two of them, a male and a female, both too preoccupied with each other to notice his presence. He stood on the threshold watching them intently. The air was thick with the scent of hay, and the flickering lantern cast writhing shadows on the walls, creating an atmosphere of comfort and safety for the humans. But the beast knew that this comfort would be shattered in an instant. Tilting his head to the side, he watched with interest as the humans fumbled in the far corner. Their movements were quick and jerky, full of passion and desire. The beast had calculated everything precisely. He knew that this moment, when they were completely absorbed in each other, would be perfect for an attack. And he was right. As he killed the man, the woman thrashed in panic, clumsily trying to escape. Her screams pierced the night, but no one came to her aid. Fate caught up with her as well. The beast took the essence of the man, feeling a surge of strength and energy. Returning to the woman, he made a surprising discovery. The female carried a fetus. Half dead, she gave birth right before his eyes. But she lacked the strength. She died, and the squirming, bloody piece of flesh got stuck halfway. The beast paused, contemplating his actions. The decision seemed obvious, but then something strange happened to him. Jumping onto the corpse, he used his weight to literally squeeze out the newborn. He bit through the umbilical cord, carefully picked up the squealing, slippery human across the torso, and rushed to the village. All the way to the human settlement, the beast thought about the tiny life beating and trembling between his upper and lower jaws. This tiny bundle of flesh was so vulnerable and helpless that even the beast, accustomed to blood and violence, was moved. They were walking in the park. I can't seem to find that damned letter with the will, Peter said, flicking stones with his cane. I've turned the whole house upside down. I've found servants' hidden money stashes, obscene magazines subscribed to in the gardener's name, mortgage papers, even the shoes that went missing five years ago. Everything except the letter. Susan, whom Walter considered the most beautiful girl in Britain and the rest of the world, looked at him sympathetically. Maybe your father never wrote one, or destroyed it at the last moment. Unlikely. There would have been scraps or ashes or something. She touched his shoulder. Don't despair. Everything will work out. That thought is the only thing keeping me from giving up. They walked in silence for a while, 
enjoying the blossoming nature. The weather was wonderful. The sun gently warmed the earth, and what hadn't melted yet quickly turned into a murmuring trickle. The few passers-by they encountered bowed ceremoniously and continued on their way. Peter, I wanted to tell you something. She paused, seeing a man in a checkered jacket walking his collie. As they passed, the dog growled fearfully, tucking its tail and bolting away from Peter, dragging its owner along. Did you see that? She kept glancing back at the dog. What was that? I wonder what scared her so much about you. I have no idea, Walter shrugged. But it's not the first time. This morning I went to check on Druzhek in the stable. The poor thing hurt his leg, and imagine he wouldn't let me near him. He neighed, kicked, nearly broke the stall. This is a horse that has known me since it was a foal, and the yard cat. She hissed, puffed up, though she used to let me pet her. So, what did you want to say, Susie? Oh, I forgot. The girl blushed, avoiding his eyes. Peter stopped, looking at her, unsure of what to do with her hands. Don't worry about what's happening to me. I'll manage. Or maybe you want to share something serious. Did something happen? Tell me. I'll do everything I can. No, no, sir. Everything is fine. You shouldn't ask for anything, especially since I didn't want to tell you anything like that. Please, don't worry. All I wanted to say is... She froze, carefully choosing her words, hiding her eyes and blushing, making her even more beautiful. Peter's head swam. Obeying a sudden impulse, he stepped forward, pulled her close and leaned in for a kiss, but her gloved hand stopped him. She firmly whispered, no, please, not now. When, then? When? Something in her tone alarmed Peter. Later, she insisted, stepping back and adjusting her dress. My God, you completely disregard precautions. Sorry, he muttered. I've been out of sorts these days. She hesitated. I'll write to you. Don't see me off. Then she straightened her hat and walked toward the church. Peter watched her back, listening to his own thoughts. And what arose in his mind at the sight of her silhouette made him feel a mix of burning excitement and genuine fear. Peter Walter would never have thought of such things, even in his wildest fantasies. The ground was dotted with numerous tracks of dog paws and human feet. They were looking for him, combing the forest. They probably wanted to smoke him out of his lair and kill him with their long, fire-spitting sticks. Methodically examining the tracks, the beast counted a dozen human and a couple of dozen canine. Inwardly, he laughed. People think that with the help of dogs, they will find him. But no dog will catch his scent. And even if one does, it will run away, howling in fear. Unlike humans, dogs behave sensibly. They know his true power, know they are weaker, and no chance of victory exists for any of them, even the most seasoned wolfhound. But they cannot explain this to their masters. Worrying about them wasn't worth it. There was a far more important problem. Tonight, he wouldn't be hunting. He needed to get to the large multi-story house by the lake shrouded in a web of fog. The beast knew the way. He knew the layout of the yard, the outbuildings, and the house, as if he had spent his whole life there. A voice was commanding him. The beast could no longer resist. Peter awoke lying face down on the ground under a large spreading elm. He stood up, brushed off the clinging grass from his cloak and smoothed his hair. The forest rustled around him. His head felt like an empty, dusty attic. His thoughts had vanished, leaving only sensations, sounds, smells, a foul taste in his mouth. Peter licked his dry lips and tried to find his way back to his mind. It was difficult, as if he had forgotten how to think. But the muscles in his legs ached as if he had been running all night. 
his cheek burned, likely a scrape. His frock coat was split at the seam on the left shoulder. Finally, gathering the remnants of himself, he hesitantly walked toward the clearing between the trees. Like a traveler in a foreign land, he walked down the road, staring around in a daze, seeing everything as if for the first time. Reaching the crossroads with the signpost, he carefully deciphered the names until the word Walter Hall pulled him out of oblivion. That's when his memory opened like a stuck cupboard door, dumping accumulated rubbish on him. An hour later, Peter reached the house. The hall was bustling. Servants, a few villagers, and townsfolk had gathered. They were saying something, hurrying to help, but Peter didn't listen. Waving them off, he purposefully walked into the drawing room. There sat John, two other men, and the old butler Bill, who had served Peter's grandfather. He caught a snippet of a phrase, and they hung him from a branch, but it turned out to be just a common thief. What happened? Everyone fell silent at once. Peter sat down in a chair without looking. Bill instinctively stood at attention. A werewolf, sir. The monster broke into the house at four in the morning. It smashed through the back door and ran upstairs to your father's room where... Bill faltered, blinking rapidly with moist eyes, unable to find words in his confusion. I think you'd better see for yourself, John interjected. And Peter looked. Indeed, from the back door, along the corridor, the grand staircase, and the entire second floor, there was a trail of enormous prints resembling those of a wolf. The clawed door to his father's bedchamber hung on one hinge, threatening to fall at any moment. The furniture was displaced, curtains and wallpaper shredded. Paintings clung crookedly to the walls as if someone had run across them. The massive bed was overturned, and nailed to its underside was a letter with the imprint of a dirty wolf paw. Peter carefully detached the paper and took the letter to his room. For some reason, it had remained untouched. The young lord placed the letter, he was now sure it was a will, on the table. There were no inscriptions on the envelope, but inside undoubtedly was his father's last will, captured in words. What does all this mean, Peter? McCarthy stood in the doorway. And where the hell were you all night? Walter straightened up. They patiently waited for an answer. They stood at the threshold, hesitant to approach him, as if they feared something. I don't remember, he lied. Not at all? His friend sounded doubtful. Not much. Peter sniffed. Only the awakening. Someone brought scotch. After downing half a glass, he told them how he woke up at the edge of the forest and found his way back. Strange, John muttered, stroking his dandyish mustache. All this is very strange. Peter listened to the story of how the county police, along with volunteers, combed the nearby forests. People were agitated and scared because the beast was never found. John was among the hunting party. Officially, it was believed that a man-eating predator had appeared in the area, but many spoke of unholy forces, trying to explain the strange and terrible events that had shaken their world. Church attendance doubled. People sought solace and protection in faith, hoping that prayers would save them from a terrible fate. In the evenings, people locked doors and even windows tight, casting a faint light on the deserted streets. This light seemed the only protection against the darkness that could hide any horrors. News of the deaths reached the journalists. Leading newspapers were filled with articles about the Yorkshire monster. Peter saw how this image captured the imagination of people, turning fear into something tangible and sinister. The public dispersed by lunchtime. The rest of the day, exhausted, Peter lounged on a couch in his robe, while Mrs. Gamp, his old and faithful servant, brought him wet cloths and ice, trying to ease his pain and anxiety. Peter lay there and thought. 
about the letter he had recently received, about his brother. He thought about his father, his lessons and advice, and about the phantom wolf that troubled his thoughts and dreams. These memories intertwined, creating a complex pattern that Peter could not fully understand. Then he got tired of thinking and staring at the ceiling. He daydreamed about non-existent scenes from his future happy life. There was Susie, the woman he had loved for a long time. She smiled, her face radiant with happiness and peace. In his dreams, they were together, free from all the worries and dangers that surrounded them now. These dreams were his only solace on this hard day. The day flashed by and faded like a fleeting vision, remaining somewhere on the outskirts of memory. Time seemed blurry and elusive, as if it slipped through his fingers. Now, illuminated by the full moon, the world shimmered with silver. The sky, polished clean by the clouds, flirtatiously sparkled with stars, creating an illusion of peace and beauty. The outlines of objects resembled an exquisitely detailed engraving, where attention was paid to every, even the smallest, detail. The landscape was so enchanting that Peter could not take his eyes off it. He stood by the window, admiring this magnificence, and felt his soul calm a little. The moonlight gave everything a mystical and mysterious aura, and Peter felt his thoughts drift far from worries and fears. This moonlit world beckoned him like a mirage, a mysterious vision that promised him peace and happiness. Peter felt that he could find solace in this night, in this splendor if he allowed himself to forget reality for just a moment. Peter tried not to make noise, but at the threshold, he felt someone's gaze on his back. Lord Walter, please, the woman sobbed. I will return, I promise. He stepped softly onto the path bathed in pale light. Resisting was impossible. Time stopped. Everything froze, holding its breath, seemingly a dead realm of eternal peace, through which the only living person walked calmly. He felt that his senses had sharpened to the limit, allowing him to perceive what he had never been able to see, hear, or smell before. Thousands of shades of gray, the hoot of a somber owl on a branch, the delicate scent of early flowers, the world revealed new facets, and it was like a mystery. Peter was seized by an incomparable state of delight, ecstasy, genuine joy, which he had last experienced perhaps only as a child. Unnoticed, he found himself at the edge of a grove. He stood there peacefully, breathing in the night freshness, while the moon bathed his face in soft light. From the fields came a shadow. Gradually approaching, the shadow became John McCarthy, holding a revolver in his hand. Peter watched his friend detachedly as if he were part of the scenery, noting to himself that he felt no excitement at his appearance. On his bent arm, John held the weapon in front of him. First, I want to see you transform. Moonlight fell obliquely on his brows, forming bottomless black pits in place of his eyes. It seemed that John had no eyes. Come on, he encouraged. It's a full moon now. Go ahead. Your guess is wrong, my friend. Tell that to someone else, he sneered venomously. There will be no transformation. I'm not a werewolf. You can shoot if it makes you feel better, but know this. Only I can stop it. John clicked the hammer back with a musical click. Do you think I won't shoot? Easily. Let me explain. We're somehow connected. You always seemed like a monster, McCarthy interrupted. Gloomy, aloof, and your father was a strange fellow too. Miraculously made his fortune, never made a mistake, and luck always followed him. His body still hasn't been found, right? I can imagine what it's like to watch an empty coffin being lowered into a grave. It was getting cold. John exhaled light steam. Peter shook his head hopelessly. Don't defile my father's good name. Shut up, Lord Walter. 
John barked. I'm in charge here. Peter fell silent. Smiling broadly, McCarthy took a couple of steps closer. He pulled a rolled up paper and a pen from his pocket. All right, maybe you're right. I'll give you a chance. He handed the paper to Peter. Sign it. It's a waiver. Just one signature and you can go. Peter didn't unfold the document, holding the scroll in front of him. How low you've fallen, he said hollowly. John laughed nervously. That's life, my friend. We all have to endure hardships for a better future. Befriend those who are useful to us or have affairs with them, promising engagement. I really hoped she would persuade you, but it turned out she needed more time, and unfortunately I don't have it. But it's good that everything turned out this way. John smiled again, and Peter thought he saw a predatory grin. Very slowly, he raised the paper to eye level and threw it in John's face. John flinched as if scalded. The paper flew into a half-thawed snowdrift. Snorting angrily, John pointed the revolver at the new target. The beast stood still. Only his hind legs tensed. Then he lifted his shaggy muzzle and let out a heart-wrenching howl. When he fell silent, John fired. But the bullet went up. Peter had intercepted and twisted his arm. What are you doing? John squealed. He hadn't expected this. With his free hand, Walter grabbed his neck and bit his nose. John screamed in pain, firing a couple more shots into the air and trying to break free. Clenching his jaws, Walter yanked back. John fell backward. Now, instead of a nose, a bloody snout stuck out of his white face, oozing dark, oily blood in the moonlight. Dropping the revolver and continuing to scream, he tried to stop the bleeding. Spitting the piece of flesh onto the ground, Walter calmly watched his former friend's convulsions. His lips were smeared, and a gleam appeared in his eyes that hadn't been there before. I hate you. I hate you, McCarthy rasped. Tell that to him, Walter pointed to the large wolf, whose appearance had changed slightly as if the animal had shrunk in size, though it still remained deadly. And more than that, it was preparing to attack. John froze for a second, trying to understand what was happening. His eyes spun wildly in their sockets. Strong and weak, Walter observed with satisfaction. You are weak. McCarthy's legs flailed. They slipped treacherously on the frozen ice. The wolf crept closer. Finally, he managed to get up. At that moment, the predator jumped, biting his throat and throwing him back down. Powerful jaws clamped once, twice. Bones crunched. Something gurgled, and the scream turned into a mumble, which faded. During the struggle, the surviving man picked up the weapon from the ground. When the wolf tried to attack him, the man hit the animal in the chest with precise shots, the wolf fell, failing to reach the enemy by a few inches. It was still breathing, whimpering, when McCarthy's companions, waiting nearby, came running to the sound of the shots. Making sure the Lord was not in danger, they finished off the predator. Later, one of the hunters confessed to another that before the shot, something human flickered in the wolf's eyes. They laughed a little and soon forgot about it. Walter Jr. returned home safe and sound. After that night, the terrible attacks on people in Yorkshire County ceased. The residents sighed with relief. Life returned to its course. So it happened. Now he needed to get to London, the city of great opportunities, where the beast could fully reveal his talent. From now on, at his disposal were the most advanced, the most skillful tools created by nature human hands. And with these hands, with the knowledge of anatomy embedded in his head, he could not just kill but turn victims inside out, disembowel them. The hunt continues.